let us next go on to apply this transformation rule to a special case the special case being the situation where u lambda a this transformation is itself an infinitesimal lorentz transformation or the operator u corresponding to an infinitesimal lorentz transformation remember under such a situation u lambda a gets replaced by u i plus omega epsilon this omega and this epsilon of course are independent of the omega and epsilon that we had in the last step but these are infinitesimal transformation parameters anyway and we are going to replace this by identity plus i by 2 rho sigma j rho sigma minus i epsilon rho p rho and of course the inverse this case is pretty straightforward. The inverse, of course, is the adjoint, and therefore is just minus i by 2. Adjointing changes i to minus i. J rho sigma would become the adjoint operator for J rho sigma, but that's the same as J rho sigma. Similarly, you get plus i epsilon rho p rho. Just a change of sign of the omegas and the epsilons. Now, when I take these forms and plug them back, let's say in the first equation. The second equation will of course be very similar. What I'm going to get is the following. I get identity minus i by 2 omega rho sigma j rho sigma. Note that I change the indices here to, from mu nu to rho sigma simply because I don't want to clash with the mu nu indices on j. So that's the u inverse, then you have j mu nu, then you have identity plus i by 2 omega rho sigma j rho sigma minus i epsilon rho p rho. This of course was the left hand side of this expression. For the right hand side what we need to do is replace each of the lambda mu rho and lambda nu sigma and a, a nu by the corresponding infinitesimal version that is lambda mu rho gets replaced by delta mu rho plus omega mu rho lambda nu sigma gets replaced by delta nu sigma plus omega nu sigma j rho sigma minus delta mu rho plus omega mu rho a nu gets replaced by epsilon nu because that's the infinitesimal version here p rho and you have to add up to this delta nu rho plus omega nu rho epsilon mu p rho so this is what you have for the infinitesimal transformation replacing u lambda a. Now let us carefully take a look at the left hand side and the right hand side of this expression separately. In the left hand side, let me remind you once again, we are only going to calculate up to first order in the infinitesimal quantities omega and epsilon. So products like omega times omega or omega times epsilon, etc. are going to be ignored. So one term that you will get is simply by taking 1 from here, j mu nu from the middle, that you have to take anyway, and 1 from here, so you get j mu nu. That's a term which has no infinitesimals in it. Then you get a first order term by taking this and this and 1. So minus i by 2, omega rho sigma, j rho sigma, j mu nu. Now you can also take 1 from here, j mu nu from here. Of course, there's no choice here to take j mu nu anyway. And this one from the third factor. And you end up with i by 2, 
Now you have to be careful about the order. One, of course, is just the identity. Then you have j mu nu. Then you have omega rho sigma, which being a number can be pulled out. But what is important is here j rho sigma comes afterwards. What you can notice is that what you are getting here is actually a commutator of these two operators. Very similarly, if you take a look at this times this times 1 and 1 times this times this, it's easy to see that what you get is i epsilon rho p rho's commutator with j mu nu. In fact, if you combine these two terms, you can easily rewrite the, this as the commutator of j rho sigma with j mu nu. So this is what you have on the left hand side. Two commutators and the original value. What about the right hand side? Well, you can see delta mu rho delta nu sigma times j rho sigma obviously gives you j mu nu using the magic of the delta symbols. Then you can take delta mu rho omega nu sigma with j rho sigma. So the delta mu rho, the delta symbol essentially makes this j mu sigma. So you are left with omega nu sigma j mu sigma. Similarly, you could take omega mu rho from here, delta nu sigma from here and j rho sigma of course you have to take. So delta nu sigma j rho sigma will make this j rho nu and that's multiplied by omega mu rho. Now that is all that you get from here because the other term, the fourth one, will have two omegas and you ignore that. Things are pretty straightforward here as well. In fact, since you already have an epsilon which is infinitesimal here, you will not take the omega from this factor because that would have given you a second order term which you are not allowed to take. We are only calculating at the first order, let me remind you. So you will just have to take delta mu rho with epsilon nu p rho. So you get minus epsilon nu p mu, that's because of the delta, plus epsilon mu p mu. So this is what this expression boils down to. Of course, you can cancel out the j mu nu's. And once again, since the omega can be made non-zero while keeping epsilon zero, that is, you can just think of an infinitesimal Lorentz transformation with no translations. And you can also think of a translation with no non-trivial Lorentz transformation. The term with omega on both sides have to match separately. So do the terms with epsilon. So what you conclude from here is you are going to get minus i by 2 omega rho sigma times this commutator equals omega nu sigma j mu sigma plus omega mu rho j mu rho j mu sigma but omega mu rho j rho nu And the other term that you are going to get is i epsilon rho times the commutator of p rho and j mu nu will be minus epsilon nu p mu plus epsilon mu p nu. So what this allows us to do is evaluate, is determine these two commutators. So not only does the Poincare algebra tell us what kind of generators you are going to get, exactly how many generators, it also tells us what the commutators between those generators are going to be. So what we have done here is 
is figure out exactly what the Poincaré algebra is. The algebra which the generators of the Poincaré group actually obey. Of course, determining the actual commutators takes a bit more work. The second one is easier to work with, so let me just demonstrate that first. If I wrote this down, let's take a look at the right hand side. I would want an epsilon lower row on the right hand side so that we can compare. But that's easily done. You might say that you don't have an epsilon row anywhere in sight. In fact, you don't even have a lower index epsilon in sight. On the right hand side, you have only upper index epsilons. But that is easily remedied. This is actually epsilon row times this term is eta mu rho. That's the raising of the operator which will give me the epsilon mu here. P in nu. Minus, well, epsilon upper nu will be obtained by eta rho nu P nu. And now you can immediately compare between two sides. The epsilon, epsilon 0, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3 are all independent parameters. So each of their coefficients have to match independently. So you are left with this particular commutator. I, P rho commutator with J mu nu is given by eta mu rho P nu minus eta rho nu or nu rho P mu. So this is the commutator of the momentum operators with the angular momentum operators. Now, figuring out the commutation relation between the j's takes a slight amount more work. The only reason for that being that the omega rho sigmas are not independent of each other. They are anti-symmetric under the interchange of rho and sigma and as we have seen before, you can only compare two coefficients if they are already anti-symmetric in rho and sigma. As you can easily see from the expression, the coefficient on the left hand side is already anti-symmetric in rho and sigma, but the coefficient on the right hand side is not. So it will take a bit more work. Even before we go there, we actually need omega rho sigma on both sides. So this omega with lower indices rho and sigma is there only on the left. On the right, you do not really have omega rho sigma. In fact, you even have omega with mixed indices. But with our experience with epsilons, it's easy to see exactly what needs to be done. So let me just repeat this here in a slightly different form. Minus Now, I want an omega rho sigma and I get that simply by using the fact that omega rho sigma can be raised or at least the rho index can be raised to omega upper nu lower sigma just by using eta rho nu. Similarly, this can be made into omega sigma rho times eta sigma mu. But because omega sigma rho is minus omega rho sigma, you can take the omega rho sigma common out and you will be left with eta sigma mu j rho nu. But as I have said already, in order to compare the two sides, I have to ensure that the right hand side here is anti-symmetric under the interchange of rho and sigma. And you can easily check that if we exchange rho and sigma, what you get is not this term. So this expression is not already anti-symmetric. But anti-symmetrization is easy. All you do is interchange rho and sigma here, subtract from this expression, which will actually double this. Because if you interchange rho and sigma here, that 
along with the interchange on rho sigma, which gives you the same thing, would have given you a minus sign. So when you subtract the interchange version, you actually get twice as much. And this is then omega rho sigma by 2. You just write down the original one. And from this, subtract what we get when we interchange rho and sigma in these two terms. So we get minus eta sigma nu j mu rho and plus, remember we are subtracting so this minus becomes a plus, eta rho mu j sigma nu. Now we are in a position to compare the coefficients on both sides because we have antisymmetrized the coefficient on both sides. And after cancelling out the factor of 2 which is there on both sides and changing the sign on the left by interchanging the two terms in the commutator, we end up with the following i times j mu nu comma j rho sigma equals eta rho nu j mu sigma minus eta sigma mu j rho nu minus eta sigma nu j mu rho plus eta rho mu j sigma nu. Now this commutation relation looks quite a mouthful but notice that all the terms are multiplied by etas and eta being diagonal vanishes unless the two indices on eta are the same. So most of these terms will be zero in a specific commutation relation with specific values of mu nu rho sigma anyway. So it's really not as complicated as it appears. And let me just uh, show you a trick which will help you to remember this commutation relation without much difficulty. All you need to do is to remember the first term. In the first term, what we will do is take the closest two indices, that is nu and rho, put them on eta. Now I can put them as eta nu rho or eta rho nu, it doesn't really matter because eta is symmetric under the interchange of its two indices. But let's just say I'm going to put nu and rho on eta and the outer two indices, nu and sigma, will go in that order in j. Here the order is important. So the first term that we will write down is eta nu rho j mu sigma. Note that that is exactly the same as this particular term. Although I have written eta rho nu here, eta nu rho is of course the same as that. But that only gives us one term. We still need to write the other three. But that's actually pretty easy if you remember that the left hand side is antisymmetric under the interchange of rho and sigma, also antisymmetric under the interchange of mu and nu. So suppose I start with this term and interchange rho and sigma here and put it in with a minus sign. That's going to go some way towards making it antisymmetric in rho and sigma. That will give you nu sigma j mu rho. Do we have such a term here? Eta nu sigma of course is same as this and j mu rho with a minus sign. So this is exactly the same as this term. We should have another term with a minus sign which you get when you start from the very first term and interchange mu and nu. So you should get minus eta mu rho j nu sigma and let's check that actually is the same as this term uh, this term here we of course have j sigma nu and here we have j nu sigma that explains why this is a plus and this is a minus but they are exactly the same term Well, what about the fourth term? How would you get it? You would get it by interchanging both mu and nu and rho and sigma in this. 
So you will replace mu by nu and vice versa and rho by sigma and vice versa. But of course, when you are doing two interchanges, you get two minus signs. So that should come with a plus sign. So this will be plus eta with a mu and a rho where you had a nu. Sorry, mu and a sigma where you had a nu and a rho. And j new row. Now this is exactly the same term as this one. As you can see, the minus sign has changed into a plus because of the other order of the indices on j. So it's rather simple to remember this formula. It's really not that difficult. So we have found nearly all the commutation relations between the Poincaré generators. The one commutation relation which is still left is, of course, that between p mu's and p mu's. Now, this commutation relation cannot be found out from the way the j's transform under Poincaré transformations because there are no j's in the commutation anyway. You have to work from the way in which the p's transform. Let me just remind you that the basic rule was u inverse lambda a p mu u lambda a was lambda mu nu p nu. Just a statement that the p mu's are four vectors and so they transform like four vectors under a Poincaré transformation. Now what we need to do of course is replace this with an infinitesimal Poincaré transformation and then compare both sides. However, the answer can be arrived at very, very quickly. Notice that because we need a commutator with p mu and p nu, what we need to do is talk about a, just a translation, an infinitesimal translation here, instead of a general Poincaré transformation. And of course, if it's an infinitesimal translation, then by the same argument that we have given before, we are going to get commutator of p mu with p nu. But on the right hand side, we are just going to get delta mu nu for lambda mu nu because for a pure translation, lambda is just the identity. And this becomes just p mu. So there is no change in p mu under translation. And that immediately tells us that this commutator must be zero. So our third set of commutators for Poincaré generators are very simple. The four components or the four momenta commute with each other. So this is the complete set of commutation relations that Poincaré generators obey. In short, this is the Poincaré Lie algebra. And note that we have derived it using nothing but the composition rule for Poincaré transformations. So basically it's the geometry of Poincaré transformations which has been reflected here in these commutation relations.